Thank you, Tim, for very long and flattering introduction. Dean of the Law School, Professor Carolyn Evans, Professor Tim Lindsay, and distinguished audience. It is my privilege to be at this prestigious law school once again. And as always, I feel very much at home here. Initially, I wanted to talk about political corruption in Indonesia. Because in the last 10 years, I've spent a great deal of my time fighting corruption. And I know the mother of corruption is political corruption, or what we used to call in Indonesia state capture corruption. In the last 12 months, I worked tirelessly with my Indonesian team, as well as the Australian team, to defend Miuran Sukumaran and Andrew Chan. To do whatever possible to save the lives and ultimately to save all of us from that penalty. As you know, we lost both Muran and Andrew were executed. We lost not only those who were executed, but we also lost the very principle of human rights, the right to life. But the struggle to fight against the death penalty continues. Dear friends, I feel obliged at this point in time to offer my observations and my thoughts about that penalty. The title of my lectures tonight is That Penalty and the Road Ahead, a case study of Indonesia. Muran Sukumaran and Andrew Chan, together with six other individuals, were executed in Indonesia three months ago. I still remember vividly Muran's words when I hugged him before I left the prison. He said he appreciated my persistence in defending their rights to life over the past eight years. They both knew I was initially reluctant to take up their case because it was clearly related to the drug business. I'm not only against drugs, I'm also against smoking. It took me almost a month before I agreed to take up the case, which I did only on the condition that I would limit myself to challenging the constitutionality of the death penalty in the law on narcotics. The provisions used by both prosecutors and judges in the death penalty verdicts against Muran and Andrew. The judicial review, which I filed in the Constitutional Court, asked the judges to rule the death penalty unconstitutional, thereby invalidating those clauses in the law on narcotics that provide for the death penalty. I hope that with such a ruling, I could overturn, overturn all death penalty verdicts in all Indonesia. I was confident that the judicial review would be granted, particularly because the court has recently ruled that the right to life could not be derogated under any circumstances. The Constitutional Court, however, rejected our judicial review, declaring that the death penalty did not conflict with the right to life in the Constitution. <coughs> Indonesia has had the death penalty since the Dutch colonial time, when the Criminal Code was introduced. Article 10 of the Criminal Code stipulates that, that penalties are divided into two parts, primary penalties and additional penalties. Primary penalties consist of the death penalty, imprisonments, detention, and fines. Additional penalties cover the revocation of certain rights, the confiscation of assets, and the public announcement of the court verdicts. 
legally the inclusion of the death penalty in other laws is based on its presence in Article 10 of Criminal Code. Existing laws that provide for the death penalty include the narcotic laws, the terrorism law, the law on corruption eradications, and the law on human rights court. You can imagine the law on human rights court has death penalty stipulations. That's probably only in Indonesia. In Aceh, a special autonomous province where Islamic criminal law applies, the death penalty has also been introduced for the crimes of adultery and rape. Although it has not yet been implemented, Indonesia, like most Muslim majority countries, appears to have no intention of changing its status as a retentionist country. According to the Department of Law and Human Rights, there are at least 127 people on that row in Indonesia. They are mostly Indonesians, but there are also several foreigners, most with death sentences for drug trafficking, including nine, 11 from Malaysia, 7 from Nigeria, 5 from China, and two each from the Netherlands and South Africa. There are also 463 people serving life, life sentence in Indonesia. 403 of whom are Indonesian citizens. Foreigners include Malaysians, Iranian, Australian, Nigerian, Taiwanese, Filipinos, and the Thai nationals. Within ASEAN, seven other countries retain the death penalty. Brunei Darussalam, the Lao People Democ Democratic Republic, Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. Although their approach to the sentence varies, two countries, the Philippines and the Cambodia, have abolished the death penalty entirely. As has Indonesia's closest neighbor is Timor. Brunei Darussalam, Laos and Myanmar retain the death penalty in their domestic laws but are abolitionists in practice. Myanmar commuted all death sentences in January 2014 and has conducted no execution since 1998. Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand and Vietnam still carry out executions. Indonesia appears to execute more than the other four countries mentioned. Like Malaysia, Singapore has conducted fewer executions in recent years. Vietnam held at least seven executions in 2013 and three in 2014. Thailand executed only two people in 2009, and none since. Malaysia and Thailand are seriously considering applying a moratorium. Vietnam also plans to restrict the applications of that penalty. Understandably, it is not easy to abolish that penalty, especially in countries where there are still wrong, strong cultural notions of retributions and revenge. In countries where Islam is the religion of the majority, the notion of the death penalty for certain crimes seems to be non-negotiable. And those who promote abolition can be accused of being anti-Islamic. Some progressive Islamic scholars however, have reinterpreted Islamic texts, commenting that retribution or revenge should be weighed against forgiveness. In some countries, the belief that the death penalty will not only act 
as a deterrent, but will also restore order and honor. Also complicates abolition. In Papua, South Sulawesi and Central Kalimantan, for instance, killing is seen as an act to restore a wrong person's reputations. Despite this, ideas of retribution and revenge are losing favor internationally, and people have started to consider other forms of punishment. The fact that moratorium are being discussed is an indication of a growing awareness that the treatment of prisoners must also be changed. In ASEAN, not all members have, surprised, have supported a proposed moratorium. But more countries see it as a more realistic option. As shown in one of the tables, Indonesia eventually moved from opposition to a moratorium to abstaining from voting. The Indonesia, Indonesian 2012 policy of abstaining from voting on the ASEAN moratorium proposal did not last long domestically. In 2013, before the general election, Indonesia resumed executions. Five people were executed, two for drug trafficking and three for premeditated murder. During the 10 years under President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, six, 16 individuals were executed. Since Joko Widodo became president in October 2014, there have been two, ex two rounds of executions. Six people were executed in January 2015, and another eight in April, most for drug trafficking and only a few of premeditated murder. The Attorney General, Mohamed Prasetyo, has announced a third round of executions, although the place and time are yet to be determined. The last two rounds of execution were a serious and dangerous setback for democracy and human rights compliance. The international community reacted openly and harshly. Social media went wild, with many posts accusing Indonesia of being barbaric. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, appealed to Indonesia to refrain from using the death penalty for drug-related crimes. Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott as Indonesia to remember Australia's, Australia's health after the 2004 tsunami and spare the life of Muran and Andrew. Protests and criticism also came from Indonesians. A noted poet and novelist, Lakshmi Pamuncha, penned an emotional piece for The Guardian in which she painted Joko Widodo as an inhumane person and commented that he had been called a murderer and his name painted in blood. Human rights organizations are also pleaded with the governments not to execute, arguing that the right to life is constitutionally guaranteed. In the meantime, Protests were issued by leading human rights organizations, such as Contrast, Impartial, Legal Aid Institute, Human Rights Working Group, and few others. Indonesian law provides that in that penalty cases, everyone must be given time to exhaust any and all available legal Recourses. The chairman of the National Commission on Human Rights, Havid Abbas, stated that it was necessary 
to improve legal infrastructures, not prioritize the executions of death row prisoners. The government argued that backing down would tarnish their international reputation and was unwilling to wait for the legal process to finish. Joining the protest, singer Angun Sasmi, now a French citizen, posted eight objections to the death penalty on her Facebook. Those included, this included that, that she opposes the death penalty for every individual, regardless of his or her nationality. And Indonesia can demonstrate to other countries about its commitment to human rights. Sasmi protest was quoted by almost every major media outlet in Indonesia, prompting anger from people on the far right who accused her of being legally ignorant and unaware of the unprecedented risks faced by young people if the death penalty were opposed. In the name of human rights, especially the right to life, as it is guaranteed by the 1945 constitutions, the government of Indonesia should have cancelled the executions. Article 28A of the 1945 Constitution stipulates that every person shall have the right to life and to defend his or her life and living. This is a norm that binds state and society at large. Moreover, Article 28I, paragraph 1, refers to the right to life as a non-derogable human rights. Further, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which was ratified into Indonesian law in 2005 in Article 6, paragraph 1, stipulates that every human being has the inherent right to life. This right shall be protected by law. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. The right to life stands as most fundamental or supreme human rights in the most absolute sense. Paragraph 2 of Article 6 states that in countries that have not abolished the death penalty, it may only be imposed for the, next, for the most serious crimes. Ban Ki-moon, General Secretary of the United Nations, rightly stated that the term most serious crimes must be understood in a very restrictive sense, meaning that it is limited to premeditated murder or intentional killing. Debates on the right to life during the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were always linked to the issue of the death penalty, because countries like the United States and the United Kingdom insisted the death penalty should be an exception to the right to life. The concept of the most serious crimes emerged as a compromise during the drafting process. At the time of drafting, only a minority of countries had taken an abolitionist stance. The 1945 Constitution also recognized the right to life as non-derogable human rights in Article 20. 8i, paragraph 1, as shown in this slide. There is no ambiguity in Article 28i, paragraph 1 of the 1945 Constitution. It clearly stated that the right to life, along with seven other fundamental human rights, cannot be diminished under any circumstances. The 1945 Constitution now undoubtedly embraces the progressive notion of human rights, making the Indonesian constitution one of the most comprehensive constitutions in the region in terms of respect for human rights. The question is whether the court recognized this. The constitutional court 
issued a ruling in case number 019-020-2005, two years before I propose a judicial review on behalf of Andrew and Miran. In it, the court reaffirmed the non-derogable nature of the right to life. Specifically, the court states that, I quote here, it is the opinion that the human rights recognize the fundamental rights of the people. It can be said that among all the rights, the right to life, the rights to defend his or her life and living are regarded as the most important human rights. The importance of the right to life has obliged Article 28I of the 1945 Constitution to affirm that the right to life cannot be derogated under any circumstances. The judicial review ap application I put forward challenging the constitutionality of the death penalty was therefore based on convincing constitutional and universal rights grounds. As mentioned, the Constitutional Court refused to declare the death penalty unconstitutional. The decision was not, however, unanimous. Three judges disagreed and produced separate dissenting opinions. In its decision, the case I brought, the, in the case I brought, Constitutional Court decision number two and three 2007, the majority of judges stated that it would be misleading to solely emphasize the right to life without considering that the implementation of this right may violate other rights, including the right to life of other people. The court argued that Article 28I, paragraph 1, must be read in conjunction with Article 28J, paragraph 2. I quote here, in exercising his or her right and freedoms, every person has the duty to accept the restriction established by law for the sole purpose of guaranteeing the recognition and respect of the right and freedoms of others. And to satisfy just demands based upon consideration of morality, religious values, securities and public order in a democratic society. Interestingly, the Article 28J paragraph 2 of the 1945 Constitution is very similar in its construction to Article 29 paragraph 2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as shown in this slide. Distinguished audience, the framers of the amendment of the 1945 Constitution appear to support the idea that the exercise of human rights must be subject to prevailing laws. Perhaps they did not consider whether people opposed to human rights who view those, this right as a Western construct could use of this, of this provision to negate or even violate human rights. The legislation containing the death penalty was enacted before and after the amendment to the 1945 Constitution and does not specifically mention Article 28J, paragraph 2. When disputes or challenges arise, however, it is likely the article will be referred to. The Constitutional Court has also not been consistent in its judgment. In decision number 19 and 20, 2005, and number 13, 2003, the Constitutional Court recognized the non-derogable human rights in Article 28I. In decision number 2 and 3, 2007, however, the rights were denied. This inconsistency is seen in the following statements. I quote again, the Constitution is the highest law. The state cannot negate the, con the Constitution because if it can, 
it will tear its own body. Article 28J, paragraph 2 of the 1945 Constitution, containing the possibility of restricting human rights as stipulated in Article 28I, paragraph 1, is not enforceable due to the praise under any circumstances. This upholds the right to life. The next statement from the same judgment seems to deny it. The court is of the opinion that all human rights can be restricted unless stated otherwise. In decision number 65, 2004, Judge Ahmad Rustandi issuing a dissenting opinion in which he stated, I quote here, there are a number of human rights guaranteed by the 1945 constitutions. Based on Article 28J, every human rights can be restricted for specific reasons except the rights mentioned in Article 28I, Paragraph 1. Once again, it must be read along the line because if the seven human rights stipulated in Article 28I, Paragraph 1, can be derogated, pushed on to Article 28J, it means that there is no difference between the seven human rights and other human rights in this case. So what is the point of stipulating the seven human rights in Article 28J? The Constitutional Court, in its majority opinion, argued that even in international law, the death penalty is still permissible, especially for the most serious crimes, provided that the state has not yet abolished the death penalty. It is extremely hard to understand the reasoning used by the governments, the legislators, and the judiciary to undermine the constitutional, the constitutional norms by arguing that no one single human rights can be above other rights. Let me talk about contradiction in policies. Human rights are important to Indonesia. However, Indonesia has often failed to live up to its commitments in the, implementa in the implementation of these rights. The recent execution of prisoners are blatant examples of disregards for the right to life. This policy contradicts Indonesia's efforts to save the lives of Indonesian migrant workers facing the death penalty abroad. The government should, of course, defend its citizens abroad. But from a moral point of view, its policies of defending its own citizens while executing foreigners are conflicted at best, if not hypocritical. Dave McRae applied this, aptly describes the tension. There's a tension, I quote here, between a blanket policy of advocating for citizens facing death penalty overseas, but continuing the death penalty domestically. Numerous interviews noted that this situation left Indonesia without moral grounds to advocate for its own citizens living abroad." End quote. Distinguished audience, according to inter information obtained from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there are currently at least 211 Indonesians, most of whom are migrant workers facing the death penalty in Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, China, Iran, Singapore, Brunei Darussalam, Thailand, Laos, United Arab Emirates, and Vietnam. With the highest numbers in Malaysia, followed by Saudi Arabia, and then China. It's not a small numbers. The original 
number of Indonesian migrant workers on that penalty overseas was 470 people. But around 259 people have now been released. The Indonesian government has done a great job in securing the release of the 259 migrant workers. But the remaining 211 still need advocacy. It is the government responsibility to provide legal assistance to its citizens on that road, irrespective of offenses they have committed. Most Indonesians sentenced to death abroad have committed offenses related to drug trafficking. Isn't it the duty of the government to do its utmost to defend all of, all of its citizens overseas, even if the citizens committed drug-related crimes? Although the data presented in one of the tables here, from 1999 to 2011, it is fair to assume that after 2011, the type of offenses committed will be similar. Interestingly, the locus for the crimes are in Malaysia, China, Singapore, Laos, and Vietnam, where the death penalty is mandatory for drug trafficking. This poses a dilemma for the government of Indonesia how can the government attempt to advocate for its own citizens who are drug traffickers while at the same time executing foreign drug traffickers in Indonesia? Reconciling conflicting policies will not be easy, of course. The majority of Indonesian's people still favor the death penalty as a means of deterrence. On the other hand, there are people who value the right to life as a constitutional right, believing that the death penalty does not deter crimes. In this kind of situations, abolition may not be possible, but is moratorium a practical answer? There's another contradiction that should be mentioned, namely, the objective of punishment. Should it be retribution or rehabilitation and re-education? It seems that the government oscillates between these two, op two opposing philosophies of sentencing. Law number 12, 1995, on correction, includes provision designed to rehabilitate inmates back into society as outlined in Article 2 and 3. Let me quote here. Article 2. Prison system is administered aiming to transform the inmate into a better person. Who realized his or her wrongdoings, corrects him, herself, and promises not to repeat the crimes in order to be accepted by society. And in the hope that he or she will take part in development and life normally as a responsible being. Article 3 of the same law, the function of prison system is to prepare inmates to be able to integrate into society and freely and responsibly participate as a member of society. The government must therefore design a systematic program of education and rehabilitation, avoiding punishment in a traditional sense. Anyone is capable of making mistakes, is capable of making mistakes. He or she should be given the opportunity to correct that mistakes and prove to society that he or she can participate in the development process. This is a noble idea, but it is much easier said than done, of course. Distinguished audience, 
Let me talk about prisons in Indonesia. As you know, Indonesian prisons are crippled by overcrowding. Yeah? And in June 2015, according to the Director, Director General of Correction online database, Indonesian prisons had 172,144 inmates. Over the entire prison systems, the overcrowding rate is approximately 45%. But this reaches more than 400% in some prisons. Given the small budgets dedicate, dedicated to the correction systems, it is very difficult to create a healthy environment, and not to mention rehabilitation programs. Reports of gang violence pure hygiene and disease are common. Indonesian prisons have become schools of crime, where people learn to upgrade their skills, to re-offend when they are released. Prisons have also become places for all kinds of illicit transactions, especially drugs. Of course, not just the inmates, but also the wardens and other prison officials are to blame for facilitating such transactions. If imprisonment is so inhumane, if torture continues, then why are offenders forced to spend so many years in prisons? Prisoners on that row face triple punishment. They are deprived of their freedoms, they are deprived of healthy and hygienic life, and they must wait for executions, an additional punishment in itself. Many spend years on that road, constantly worried and tense, with little time to participate in educational and rehabilitation programs. The government ignores the objective of education and rehabilitation outlined in Articles 2 and 3 of the Law on Correction. And it seems unconcerned by this contradiction in policies. It may pay a high price for this contradiction as it has lost the respect of many of its own people as well as the international community. I would like to talk about why the death penalty is not the answer. I have four points to make here. One, there's no evidence that it is a deterrent. In addition to contradictory norms and policies, the belief that the death penalty deters crime has not been proven. Speaking before the Indonesian Constitutional Court, Jeffrey Fagan, a law professor from Columbia University, argued that there has been no empirical evidence to suggest that death penalty has deterred crime. Fagan referred to the American experience where crime rate has never fallen, including in states where death penalty is retained. And in states where death penalty has been abolished, the crime rate has not increased. William Shabas a law professor from Ireland National University, argues that the real issue is whether the death penalty is more of a deterrent than other forms of punishment, such as life or long-term imprisonment. If the answer is no, then the death penalty has arbitrarily threatened the right to life. Shabas argues there's no empirical evidence that the death penalty has been a deterrent in America. It can only be a deterrent if a drug trafficker considers the possibility of being caught. If law enforcement does not function properly, then crime will never be deterred. Public opinion is that the death penalty will deter crime, and Saudi Arabia, Singapore, and Malaysia are held up as examples 
when the crime rate is declining. Evidence from Indonesia has not, however, supported this contention. On the contrary, crime rate has have not declined despite the fact that executions have taken place regularly. Dave McRae states, I quote here, Indonesia's use of death penalty has not been decreased since 1998 democratic transition. McRae also finds that Indonesia's court appear to have handed down death sentences more frequently under democracy. There are a number of points which relate to the current situation of the death penalty in Indonesia. President Joko Widodo has argued that, 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 that the death penalty is necessary because Indonesia is facing a drug emergency. President Jokowi has, however, failed to support this contention with reliable data, and he has been challenged by both scholars and activists. Point number two, the risk of wrongful conviction. The death penalty, of course, makes such decision irreversible. Zaid Raad Al Hussein, United Nations High Commissioners for Human Rights, once said that, I quote here, no judiciary anywhere in the world is so robust that it can guarantee that innocent life will not be taken. And there is an alarming body of evidence to indicate that even while functioning legal system have sentenced to death men and women who were subsequently proven innocent. End quote. So wrongful conviction happened. In America, opponents of the death penalty have argued that hundreds of, or perhaps thousands of innocent people have been sentenced to death. According to the Death Penalty Information Centers, in December 2011, 139 people in 26 states had been freed from that row since 1973. A study by James Lipman found that 68% of all death sentences decided between 1973 and 1995 were reversed. This shows that the possibility of error is too great to be ignored. The Indonesian criminal justice system has made mistakes. It is run by human beings with all their limitations and weaknesses. Wrongful conviction have happened in the past, for example, in the case of Senkon and Karta, who were convicted of murder they never committed. One day, a confession was made by a person who claimed to be the killer and that forced the court to re-examine the case leading to their acquittal. It is inevitable that errors will be made by judges, prosecutors, or police. The death penalty is an irreversible sentence. A wrongful conviction could be disastrous. Point number three, judicial corruption. Among judges and lawyers, as well as prosecutors and police, corruption is systemic, endemic, and widespread. It was recently found at the highest levels of the judicial system when former Constitutional Court Chief Justice Akil Mohtar was sentenced for, elect for electoral corruption. Corrupt interaction between judges, prosecutors, and police is barometer is referred to in Indonesia as the judicial mafia. The global corruption barometer lists the police and court as the most corrupt institutions in Indonesia. It is therefore unlikely that the judiciary will reform itself or get rid of the corrupt judges within its own, within its own institutions. Reform requires changes to recruitment, remunerations, 
promotion, supervision, rewards and punishments, and this is a big job. Muhammad Rivan, I think you remember this guy. This guy. The lawyer for Muran and Andrew at the court of first instance accused the judges of asking for bribes in exchange of for lighter sentences, but said the negotiation ended after the judges received an order from the superiors that that sentence must be imposed. Rivan submitted a statement to the Judicial Commission implying that some transaction took place before this order came. It is difficult to determine the truth of this statement, but it is the duty of the Judicial Commission to investigate the matter. That's why we filed the report to the Judicial Commission. Regretfully, the investigations did not take place before Miran Sukumaran and Andrew Chan were executed. We asked the Judicial Commission to summons Sukumaran and Andrew to question them. And they did not. In light of this allegation of bribery, all legal proceedings should have been declared null and void. A retrial should have been undertaken. Neither Muran nor Andrew should have been executed. As the trials were legally invalid. Justice was not served by imposing a death sentence to defective trial proceedings. Point number four. Clemency as the final recourse. The 1945 Constitution, Article 14, Paragraph 1, stipulates that the President may grant clemency and restoration of rights, and shall, in so doing, have regard to the opinion of the Supreme Court. The implementing regulations, Clemency Law Number 22, Year 2002, describe clemency as pardon in form of commutations, reduction, or nullifications of sentence. A petition of clemency can only be filed by those having a legally final and binding judgment or their family. Once a clemency petition is filed, the president has the power to grant or reject the clemency petition. This clemency is the ultimate recourse for a death row inmate. In the case of Muran and Andrew Chan, the clemency petition were never examined. Can you imagine that? Never examined by the president or the Supreme Court. No, no one interviewed Muran and Andrew. No one asked the inmates and the wardens. There was never any assessment of the petition conducted. No reason was ever given for rejecting the clemency petitions. The rejection only stated the clemency is rejected. No reason, none whatsoever. They were simply rejected outright. This was totally unacceptable and an insult to the right to life and sense of justice. 
This is my last part of presentations. No abolition and no moratorium, but what is but here? Yeah. The government has never declared a moratorium on the death penalty. The fact that a de facto moratorium occurred under President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono does not mean that this was the official position of the government. Nevertheless, nevertheless Indonesia is not a completely retentionist country either. Indonesia has never carried out as many executions as China and Pakistan, for examples. Lately, however, the government has taken a more, progress, more aggressive position, especially toward people convicted of premeditated murders and narcotics offenses. Indonesia does listen to all objections and criticisms. Internally, discussions were conducted, involved, but unfortunately, support for the death penalty was overwhelming. It will be almost impossible for the government to abolish during the high political cost that would have to pay. Some sort of compromise or alternative has to be found. The most important thing is to formulate a policy that respects human rights, especially the right to life, but still provides for the death penalty in exceptional circumstances. The government has formulated a new draft of criminal code and it has been submitted to the House of Representatives for debate. Among others, the policy paper states, I quote here, that, this, that it is necessary to postpone the implementation of death penalty or conditional death penalty for a 10-year probationary period. The rationale is in order to maintain the balance between the abolitionists and the retentionists whose number is very significant, including those who are ambivalent about death penalty in international forum." End quote. Moreover, the policy paper explained that the death penalty should not be considered a primary punishment. It is appropriate to retain the death penalty as a secondary punishment, as a compromise to the retentionists. Article 66 of the, of the draft criminal code lists five primary punishments, imprisonments, detention, supervisions, fines, and social works. The death penalty is stipulated in Article 67 which says that the death penalty is regarded as a specific punishment, charged alternatively. This differs from the current criminal code where the death penalty is listed as a primary punishment under Article 10. Further, Article 89 of the draft code stipulates that the death penalty can only be implemented once clemency is rejected by the president. The draft criminal code then allows for a 10-year probationary period before the execution may take place. Execution will not be undertaken if the death row prisoner demonstrates that he or she has been rehabilitated and so shown regret for his crimes. In that case, the Minister of Law and Human Rights may commute the sentence to add to either life or 20 years sentence. The government appears to have considered various opinions and objections and attempted to balance the conflicting position while accommodating human rights principles. The elucidation of article to Article 91 of the draft code sum up the government position. And we quote here. In this criminal code, the death penalty is no longer a principal punishment. It is, a, it is a specific punishment. Its imposition will be very selective. The judges first and foremost must consider whether in that particular case, 
An alternative punishment like life sentence or 20 years imprisonment can be imposed. If the judges are in doubt about the alternative punishment, then they may consider imposing conditional death penalty. If the convict demonstrates that he or she has been changed and rehabilitated within 10 years, the Minister of Law and Human Rights can commute the sentence into one of the alternative punishments. Therefore, it is obvious that the criminal code will restrict the imposition of death penalty in line with the sense of justice of the society. The probation period is counted from the date of clemency rejection. Distinguished audience, public discourse on the death penalty will continue. And the liberation of new criminal code in the House will be the perfect forum for proponents and opponents of the death penalty to continue this debate. The fact that the death penalty is not mandatory and is now considered an alternative punishment is a step forward. Certainly, this is a compromise, a typically Indonesian response or Indonesian way. But it may pave the way for future debate. Will human rights, especially the right to life, be honored as a basic constitutional right? It remains to be seen, of course. The new draft criminal code provides us with some optimisms, or guarded optimism at least. We should not rule out the possibility that in line with the global trend of abolishing the death penalty, Indonesia will eventually follow. That is certainly my deep hope. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, Pat Mulia, for you, uh, such a detailed uh, account going through both what has happened and giving us, which is rare in a talk like this, some hope for the future. So thank you so much thank you. Uh, for the talk. Uh, Pat, oh, I'm Helen Tarzaka, for those who don't know, know me, the Deputy Director of the Centre for Indonesian Law, Islam and Society. And Pat Mulia will now take 15, 15 minutes of questions. Uh, what our house rules are is that anybody who wants to ask a question firstly has to state who they are, no false names, uh, <laughs> and what institution they're attached to, if they're attached to one. We don't all have to be. Uh, the other thing you have to do, because this is being recorded, is you have to wait for either Catherine or Ade to come and give you a microphone, because otherwise both Pat Mulia might not hear your question, but it also certainly won't be recorded. So, who would like to start off? Okay. Professor, uh, John Mulia, Professor, thank you very much. My name is Ryan Rosario, and I don't, I'm not affiliated with any institution. Um, what I'd like to ask is, when it comes to submission to the House of is it possible that there might actually be some sort of, and you mentioned compromise at the very last thing, between, and I hate talking a binary thing, left and right, but see people on the left who might have a clemency notion in mind, and people on the right who might consider the cost of the imposition of the death penalty, the, the various legal processes as being an unnecessary burden on the state, that they could actually come together to work together for progressive abolition, might it work that way when it's submitted to the House of Reps. And I was thinking mainly because of um, an American um, American president who mentioned that it could work that way in America, where the two opposite sides might work together to abolish it. Is it possible? Well, uh, I believe, you know, it should be possible. You know, Indonesia, uh, although there are limitations, there are restrictions, you know, in, uh, in publishing or in exercising your, uh, you know, uh, point of view. But I should say we enjoy freedom to express our opinion more than other countries in the region. So 
the question of cost, the question of dilemma, the question of cultural notion, the question of Islamic uh, notion of sentencing, I think they are all open. Uh, I believe we have the momentum at the moment. Uh, of course, it is not going to be easy, but there are more people now talking about death penalty. There are more people now willing to express their opinion. And I, I think we, we, we will have a very uh, heated debate on this. One, the parliament commands the deliberation, start the deliberations. Now, they haven't done that. The one they open the deliberation, the debate, I believe all the human rights NGOs, all the human rights activists will come up with all those questions. So that would be very interesting to see. You know, uh, of course, yeah. Uh, but Indonesia prisons is not like prison here in Australia. It's not like it's not like prison in US. So I don't think the cost is the factors here. Yeah. Uh, Indonesia. has allocated quite a significant increase in uh, in their budget although it is still still very small yeah but i i do, I, 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 this, I don't see this is you know a, a cost considerations the governments uh, at that time talk about drug emergency situations now those who are sentenced to death because of drugs have to be executed. That was probably the main reasons. But my personal obs observation is there are other reasons. Yeah. I had to say it has been politicized. Yeah. In the way that the government want to get popular support for the poor performance in the economy. And keep in mind also that prior to the executions, there was a tension, there was a conflict between the police and the anti-corruption commission. And President Jokowi failed to reconcile to resolve the tension and <laughs> of course it is not the, the main reasons but I think it plays a role the president would like to get more support and to strengthen yeah or to regain you know uh, its uh, position back now it's it, it's sorry to say, but uh, I, I have the feeling, 
yeah, that contribute to that, you know, uh, probably uh, executions. Yeah. In Bali. Oh, in Bali. Okay. Uh, well. Well, I think uh, at that time, all execution took place in Nusa Kambangan. Uh, the government perhaps would like to have more, yeah, uh, to have less and less uh, attention and publicities. You know, if it is held in Bali, and that would be disasters. But I think they over that, you know, even though it was That did not stop the media from coming to Nusa Kambangan. So uh, I think that was the probably uh, th this case has has uh, attracted worldwide attention, worldwide attention, and now Indonesia paid the price, paid the price for those two executions at the time. And I've never heard any statement lately from the Attorney General that there will be other executions. He was talking about the third executions, yeah, but I don't think he made other statements, yeah, implying that the third execution will take place. So I, I believe now they are paying the price for what they have done. Nicholson, Director of the Asian Law Centre. I wonder if I could take you back to the support the Indonesian government is extending to its own citizens on death row in other parts of the world. Because I was struck, struck by two aspects of the data that you shared with us tonight. One is that the Indonesian government and those assisting it have effectively released or saved 259 people from death row. But the other aspect was what seemed to be a radical deceleration of the number of Indonesians being uh, convicted and sentenced for death row offences over the period between 2011 and 2015. And I wondered if there were lessons that you might share with us uh, and or the Australian government about the particular efficacy of the Indonesian government in its work to defend Indonesian citizens on death row when they're abroad. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh. Surprise, yeah, when I uh, got these numbers uh, from the foreign affairs, yeah, I think they've done a very uh, a great deal of success in uh, releasing those migrant workers from that sentence. I don't know exactly you know, uh, what sort of diplomacy, what sort of advocacy yeah, conducted by the governments. Uh, there has not been publicity about that. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of NGOs involved in advocating those migrant workers overseas. But those only for few cases. Yeah, in Malaysia and probably in Saudi Arabia. So what has been done by the governments in releasing them yeah, has never been publicized. So to me this is also a surprising uh, numbers. Now what happened after 2013 and 2014. Now, uh, my guess is the Indonesian have already uh, realized uh, the consequences and the uh, risks faced by migrant workers and the 
Indonesian companies that send the migrant workers have a published number of uh, books and guidance and a hotline contacts for the migrant workers. So although they probably are not that effective, yeah, but they have some assistance yeah, uh, available so they can call any time. So that probably also something yeah, uh, that has to be taken into consideration. But other than that, I'm not so sure myself. I, at one point, proposed to the Minister of Manpowers to have a program, what I called uh, Legal Aid uh, Migrant Workers Defense Fund because the government does not have that much fund to defense them. So we would like to have migrant workers defense funds set up by the government. And I was commissioned by the ministers to do that at the time. Now, the idea is to have that fund to cover all the legal expenses if needed. By that fund, we will be able to have all this lawyers retain from all different countries. And I told the governments at the time, we don't need the government money for that. We can have the employer contributing to that funds. And that was agreed upon by the ministers, but that has never been materialized, actually. Now, I think we've run out of Yes, we've run out of time now. Um, so, if I could propose a few votes of thanks. Um, firstly, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Simon Evans, uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor uh, International, for funding the visit of, of Professor Mulyo Lubis uh, through the Melbourne Asia, Asian Century a visiting fellowship. So thank you very much for that. And without that, we wouldn't have Professor Mia Lewis. I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Carolyn Evans, uh, both for your support for tonight, uh, and also in general for supporting the work of the Centre for Indonesian Law, Islam and Society. Thank you very much, Carolyn. And I'd like to thank Lewis Lau of Z Productions for filming uh, this talk. And just to mention to everybody uh, that the video will be placed on the Indonesia at Melbourne blog. Uh, if you haven't seen that already, uh, go and have a look at it. Uh, and that will be up there in the next week or two. Uh, and I'd like to thank Tim Mann here sitting in the front with his computer on. Uh, who's been live tweeting the entire of this talk. And particular thanks go to Catherine Taylor and Ade Sahato uh, for the, the organisers of this seminar and also to Aya, who isn't here, but we thank her nevertheless uh, for her assistance on tonight. So thank you very much to all three of you. And last but absolutely not least, <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank Professor Mulya Lubis so much uh, for your talk and for answering the questions. I think we're all much wiser for that. And here's just a small token uh, of our appreciation. Thank you, Helen. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there's one more thanks because without anybody listening, a talk just doesn't have the same effect. So thank you to everybody for turning up, for listening attentively and for asking questions. You can all thank yourselves. Thank you. And that concludes tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> thank you.